You know, for a lot of kids growing up, joining the Imperial Navy or Imperial Army was the completion of a lifelong dream. The Empire had it all. Massive Star Destroyers, legions of heroic stormtroopers, which created a sense of power and authority that could not be challenged throughout the entire galaxy. There is a sense of satisfaction and security that comes with knowing that you are on the stronger and more powerful side. Especially when all the propaganda and messaging coming from state organizations like Copnor are also convincing you that the Empire are the good guys. And boy were these kids in for a huge surprise when they finally deployed. The lucky ones would be garrisoned on sparsely populated remote worlds where boredom and the local fauna were the biggest threats. For others, it would be straight to the front to hellish battles like the Mimbum campaign. One of the many conflicts of the Clone Wars that never truly ended with the droids' defeat. Instead, the very clones that helped the Mimbanese fight for their freedom became their oppressors with the rise of the New Order. So, how did the Mimbom campaign go? Did the Empire use its superior technology and training to field fully mechanized infantry units supported by air cover, artillery, and orbital bombardment? Was the Empire using combined arms tactics and maneuver warfare? Perhaps they had some precision weapon systems that could target certain areas of the Mimbanese lines and create gaps that could be exploited by some powerful reserve force they had waiting. No, of course not. The Empire would instead engage in grueling trench warfare with the Mimbanese Liberation Army, a military force that clearly lacked the same manpower and firepower as the Empire. I mean, look at this guy. Had it not been for the Republic's foreign internal defense efforts, this soldier probably would still be hiding in the mud until an Imperial trooper comes along within vibroblade range. So how did this happen? You know, we're not talking about like a single Imperial unit that just happens to be dismounted and, you know, creates some temporary defense lines. Mimbom was covered in massive networks of trenches stretching hundreds of kilometers into the distance. And this looked more like the Western Front of 1916 than some futuristic war. And that's about how well the war went for both sides in this conflict as well. You had massive amounts of casualties for very little movements on the front lines. And this is because it became common for Imperial officers to lead their men in desperate human wave attacks. It was all a complete waste. Trench warfare and mass wave attacks were supposed to be rendered obsolete by the advent of large mobile weapon systems. Things like armored walkers, combat airspeeders, and starfighters. Let's also not forget that the Empire has orbital bombardment capabilities with its star destroyers. All of these capabilities should, in theory, make a foxhole or a trench line the perfect grave for an infantryman. So what happened? Well, if we take a look at our own galaxy, there's massive trench lines and fortifications being formed on the Ukrainian-Russian border in what's supposed to be a modern conflict, right? Well, for one, neither side actually has air superiority over the point of contact. And one side has limited amounts of artillery, but it's pretty precise thanks to technological developments and just plain old creativity. We actually know this because a lot of you guys out there helped this channel raise money to buy tablets and drones that are being used by artillery spotters. Whereas the other side is using Soviet-era artillery tactics, which involve saturating the area with huge amounts of shells. The point is, neither army is able to really dislodge the other side using indirect fire support. Instead, they have to rely on old-fashioned ground assaults. And so the trench lines and fortifications that we speak of just show us how evenly matched these two sides are at this point of the conflict. Which is really not what's happening between the Empire and the Mimbanese. The Mimbanese Liberation Army, for the most part, is a small insurgency group. Uh, they lack very little training on how to handle heavy weapon systems. They don't have many weapon systems, and the ones that they do have are stolen or rather gifted to them. They have no starfighter corps. They definitely have no capital ships in orbit. But somehow these Mimbanese are able to stand and fight against the Empire in grueling attrition warfare using trenches instead of relying on hit-and-run guerrilla tactics. You know, usually when a conventional army is fighting an insurgency, what they really want is for the insurgents to stand and fight so that they could just overwhelm and destroy them with their firepower. And that's what's happening with the Mimbanese, except they're not losing. Now, something clearly is wrong with the Imperial command structure and doctrine here. Which then reminds me, of course, it's Palpatine who created all this nonsense. Palpatine has no prior military experience. He's just some guy who convinced the citizens of the Republic to destroy their own government and give him unlimited power because he was able to orchestrate one of the biggest false flag operations in galactic history, the Clone Wars. 
The Confederacy of Independent Systems, while rooted in real grievances, was controlled opposition. Their leader, Dooku, was Palpatine's apprentice, and at every step of the war, Darth Sidious more or less knew exactly what Dooku's larger strategy was going to be, and that's because he created it. So the Clone Wars, as devastating and heartbreaking as it was for those who were involved in it, was just a Sith game. Palpatine was literally playing clones and droids and going pew, 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 pew. It actually didn't matter at all if the clone army was functional or not. I mean, it was a pretty well-designed army, but we'll never know because it was never really tested in an actual battle because the droids were always programmed to do exactly what the Sith needed them to do. And so the Clone Wars was all about appearances and how the battles looked instead of how they functioned. And this was really Palpatine's specialty. I mean, there is no doubt that Palpatine was a political mastermind, but these skills, they really do not translate into understanding how to create a functional military force. So why are we surprised that the Imperial military created by the same man was a complete shit show? Now, Palpatine relied on individuals like Will of Tarkin to develop the Imperial Military Doctrine, which basically believed that form over function designs was the best way to get people to obey, as in let's forget about actually doing the hard work of state building, developing a security infrastructure, training troops for peacekeeping missions, and learning how to do outreach in local communities and perhaps even build up local defense forces. No, Tarkin was too lazy to tackle all of these very difficult issues. Instead, he believed that by simply making an example out of planets like Jeddah, Scarif, and Alderaan by carrying out massive mining disasters on them, that people would just suddenly listen because they're fearful of the Death Star. Tarkin, who was never really socialized as a child, was always exceptionally naive and irrational in his approach when dealing with his fellow human beings. Instead of preventing the rebellion from growing, Tarkin would become one of the best recruiters for the Rebel Alliance. So how could such an incompetent individual rise so high in the Imperial ranks? Well, it's the same reason why the Imperial military is using trench warfare and mass wave attacks against a far inferior enemy. It's the same reason why the Empire could spend a huge portion of the entire galaxy's GDP on the Death Star. It's a lack of checks and balances. It's a lack of voices to counter the stupid ideas of a dictator. And I know you guys hear me say this a lot on this channel. But here's the thing, authoritarian regimes are always going to be less efficient and less competent than alternative systems in which the population shares power, like a liberal democracy. It's not that liberal democracies are morally superior. I mean, they tend to be, but that is really not important here. From a more rational point of view, liberal democracies are just far more flexible and efficient than an authoritarian regime. On a civic tech tree, authoritarianism would be the base technology. It is the first type of governance ever created by, you know, cavemen back in the day. It's basically one man deciding everything, and naturally because it's just one person in charge, that individual has to spend a good amount of time maintaining his power rather than just governing. And naturally, Palpatine in that position would target his critics first. The Imperial Senate would lose much of its abilities and powers and eventually be completely disbanded around the time of the destruction of Alderaan. By getting rid of that representative body, now you know, the members of the 224th Imperial Armored Division no longer have a voice. Han Solo can't write a letter to the Senator from Corellia and talk about the terrible conditions on the battlefield. Cassian Andor can't speak to the media and explain that Imperial citizens are being used in human wave attacks like cannon fodder. Public dissent would have forced the Imperial commanders on Bim Bomb to either change their tactics or maybe withdraw from the conflict completely. And so what should have been a battle in which the Empire evolves their tactics and is successful turns into the Battle of Verdun for absolutely no reason. And this kind of nonsense runs rampant all across the Imperial military. This is why you see so much outdated tactics being used by Imperial commanders. It's a lack of checks and balances. This is what allows corruption to begin to explode at the lower administrative levels inside the Imperial government. I mean, what prevents an Imperial quartermaster from just selling half of his stock of proton torpedoes on the black market as long as he pays his own commanding officer and the rest of the people in the chain of command? There's really no one who can tell them not to do this. Emperor Palpatine doesn't want watchdog groups making sure that the Imperial military is functioning legally and properly. He doesn't want think tanks studying Imperial tactics and improving them and giving him suggestions because that might prove that Imperial Palpatine doesn't really know what he's doing. Even the Imperial Navy, which was highly visible and enjoyed a certain amount of political flexibility, was ultimately a place of regression and arrogance. I mean, how many times have Imperial commanders failed to deploy their TIE fighters when encountering a rebel threat and, you know, suffered greatly because of that? 
Luther and Rael, one of the early founders of the rebellion, got away from an Imperial patrol because of this. Red Squadron and Yellow Squadron during the Battle of Yavin never should have even made it within a few thousand miles of the Death Star. This battle station had thousands of starfighters on board, but Tarkin thought it would be a stupid idea to deploy them. If the Empire was a living and breathing organization with the structure in place to learn and evolve its military doctrine, they would have figured out something to counter Imperial commanders not launching their TIE fighters. But unfortunately, that's not what the Empire is, and the First Order, the successor of the Empire, still suffered from the same problem 30 years later, when Poe Dameron was able to single-handedly take out every point defense weapon on an 8-kilometer long siege vessel, opening it up to attack from heavy bombers. We could talk about how the Empire is evil, but I, I feel like words like good and evil are kind of meaningless in a debate because their definition is so vague and not necessarily universal. But if we frame the Empire and authoritarian governments as incompetent, antiquated, and inflexible, then we can actually have a much stronger case about why such systems are inferior and need to be resisted. And that's because a lot of supporters of authoritarian regimes are brainwashed into thinking that the ends justify the means. when. That's almost never the case. Liberal democracies outperform their authoritarian counterparts in almost every metric, whether it's uh, you know GDP per capita, human development index, or even military power, as it's you know clearly seen in Russia right now. This really should not be a controversial opinion or something I need to explain. You know, I used to make a bunch of videos about how the empire was good because, like, do I really need to explain to people why authoritarian regimes are bad? But unfortunately, in today's day and age, where we are bombarded with information, it's becoming harder and harder for people to sort through all of that information and have, I guess, context for what that information means in the larger picture. You know, growing up, we always feared censorship, when perhaps the equal danger is so much information that the average man or woman in a democracy no longer even understands what is right or wrong. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.